I think we've got uh, some really interesting props that are happening here, too. What do you think? <laughs> cool. All right, friends, let's start off with something easy, I guess. Uh, what is it about these characters that makes them so universally appealing? It's an easy one, right? It's really easy. First of all, it's a pleasure to work with you. Oh, well, thank you. Gosh. She's
Uh huh. We are. Uh, he's easy, by the way. <laughs> he is so easy. No. No, he's not. You're funny. <laughs> You're the funniest there is. And he's brilliant, too. I mean, I first, I remember seeing him on television. He was surrounded by the major motion picture television stars in the world. I mean, he's the, I mean, they introduce him, and he comes out and he does Muhammad Ali. <laughs> oh, with, with, with guys like Bob Hope and Dean Martin. It's all these huge guys. And he comes out and he does Muhammad Ali, and I said, Who is this guy? Where did he come from? And, you know, fortunately, we got to work together. The first show we ever did was Mighty Man and Yuck. Mutual admiration, of course, because when I first started doing voices, I, I like I did a lot of stand-up comedy. What he's referring to was the uh, D. Martin Rose for George Burns, which was uh, which was so much fun. But, uh, so I was doing stand-up in those days, and I just started doing voices, and we kicked into Scooby-Doo, and that was my first cartoon show. And uh, yeah, and then so. I was watching Sonny and Cher, and I see this little round ball come out, and then start doing all this sound effects, and it just about whatever the heck he did. And I thought, I better not get in the sound business. And I'm competing with that. No way. And it was him. And then little did I know uh, that he was doing the voice of that. All the did all these characters and all the other stuff we did on show. This is mutual admiration. We'll get past it and we'll get into other stuff. But it's true. We really do like each other a lot. And we went in to do this show called Mighty Man and Duck. And there was Peter and Frank. And we were talking about the shows. And he said, Well, I see you on the Mood Griffin in the tonight. Blah, 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 blah. And I said, Well, I just found out you did the Sunny Chair in that ball thing. <laughs> almost kicked me out of the business when I saw that. You were so good. I'm still kind of ball. <laughs> so then anyhow, he does this ball too. And then the characters we do in our first show together, Mighty Man and Young, he plays what? The hero, right? Mighty Man. What does Frank play? <laughs> Yucks. <laughs> the ugliest dog in the world. <laughs> so ugly. He had to wear a doghouse over his head. <laughs> that was in the show. You never saw me as a dog with a <laughs> house on his head. Uh, they were hard up in those days. <laughs> For material. Oh my yeah. God. Yeah. Let's do a thing about you know, an ugly dog. You know? Yeah. And, 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 and I put a doghouse on his head. Oh, I like that. I thought you were nice to hear that. Do you remember the voice you did in there? Huh? Do you remember your Mighty Man voice? Yeah. Oh, 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 oh. I think it was old Big Crow. Well, about all of these various characters that you can play, how do you keep your voice healthy when you have to record for you know many, many hours a day and all these different <laughs> extremes of kinds of characters that you get to do? Well, Frank, you should answer that because he does things that are really beyond uh, understanding, you know. I... <laughs> well, thank you, I think. <laughs> actually, you know, I mean, this is, this is kind of silly, but absolutely true. Um, you need to get sleep. Like, if, if I know I've got a big thing coming up the next day, Desperately, you need sleep, you know, because it's healthy cords, rest. Um, and then uh, warming up, you know, beforehand, if you got, like, monsters to do, I uh, do a lot of... Well, that hurts. <laughs> So really you want to kind of warm up, and I live far away from the studios um, when we were doing all that, so I would warm up in the car on the way to work just do the vocal sounds that uh, singers do. And then 
which is us. I'm very serious about it. stand-up, I was working with Ann Margaret in Las Vegas, and uh, I got a sore throat, and I would always just drink Coca-Cola, because the, the bubbles feel good on the throat, and it you know, actually does help. Yeah, and I, I found that that works pretty good, as well as the obvious things, warm tea and soup. But she had some kind of concoction, you know, that was, uh, <laughs> this is what is, you know, singer, and she had, it was like, maple syrup, and it, it, it tasted horrible. So, I went back to Coca-Cola. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> so that's my answer. You can answer me. I, uh, I stay away from uh, dairy products. Mm. For all you future voiceover people out there, stay away from dairy products the day you're going to record. Yeah, takes away all your okay, cotton mouth textures. Yeah. Of course, if anybody's like me, blowing your nose every 20 minutes, since the COVID since oh, the oh, oh, vaccination or whatever it is. My gal, Brandy, he, she does the same thing. Runny nose. Anybody have a runny nose from the vaccinations? Everybody with a runny nose, can you please stand up? Back to the question. Uh, I'll tell them. Six foot five. Ah, <laughs> I do have a question for you. Uh, how many of you guys know Pat Fraley? Voice actor? Very funny, crazy guy. You know Pat. This is just in a tail end of what your question was about what to do for the throat. Another thing, in addition to the uh, uh, dairy products, is watch out for pineapple. Because that acid, if that gets in your vocal cords, your highs are gone. So the story is Pat Fraley, who's an absolute goofball. We were uh, just about to go into a session, and he and I'm eating, you know, because sometimes I'll have nice little spreads for you at the recording studio. So I'm eating my fruit, banana, apple. Just wondering the sound effect. So I get to a pineapple. I get the pineapple, and I'm taking a bite of it, and Pat Fraley, I have no idea what he said or what the joke was, but it made me go, Pat sent that acid right into my vocal cords, mm -hmm. and I lost all my highs, and gone. So now it came to my part in the script, and I have one of those things, I'm talking about I'm talking about <laughs> Totally gone. So watch out for acidy fruit as well. True story. Very good advice. <laughs> well, beyond being able to warm up before you have a longer session, do you have any other pre-recording rituals to you know, put a sock on your head or you know, scare those? <laughs> I don't know, I think warming up in the car is definitely one, especially if you're doing sound effects, you're never doing sound effects. But most of the time, I think you're, uh, you're pretty much good to go, you know, unless there's, let's say, a really intense session that you know, when you do a hot stuff or something. Do you believe it? Well, the tones are uh, difficult. I mean, a lot of the time, depending upon, of course, what I just said, what I've eaten. But uh, fatigue, uh, fatigue does an awful lot, uh, especially if I'm required to do a deep, 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 deep voice. Down here, we're up in this prime, you know. 
Such a nice noise. I love the steel. Yeah. <laughs> Woo! My brother Larry, uh, our voices were very, very similar. And uh, I impersonated my brother Larry uh, to be, become Optimus Prime. But, uh, the, the thing I remember him, uh, he, he could go from a high voice like this down to a Peter. <laughs> uh, a Marine, you know, when he gets uh, stern or serious and he's looking at you and his voice drops down, it's scary. No, but a Marine <laughs> is scary enough. But wow. So I, I will just tell you this little bit of a story. He asked me, uh, I needed the car. We were living together in the early 80s. And he said, Peter, uh, uh, do you need the car? And I said, yeah, Larry, I, I, I do. I need it around 11 o'clock. I have an audition. And he says, what do you do for me? I'm going to be a, a truck. I know, said Larry, but Larry, he's a, he's a hero truck. I mean, he's going to be a, a, a hero. And he went, well, Peter, <laughs> if you're going to be a hero, be a real hero. Oh, oh, where did that come from, you know? Well, you know. Whenever he saw Vietnam, he brought home because uh, when he, his voice went down there, I know he was talking about being a leader. And he says, you're going to be a hero, be a real hero. Don't be a Hollywood hero. Not about phony yelling and screaming and stuff. Be strong enough to be gentle. Yeah. 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 So, in 1980, Larry's voice hung in my head. I went to that audition, I just could hear Larry. You know, I could just hear his voice. And I could have just come out and said, I've told this story so many times, but it brings truth so heavy. They could have said, my name, instead of Optimus Prime. You could have just said, my name is Larry Cullen. <laughs> Leader of the Autobots. <laughs> 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 Do you have any similar stories about uh, things where you've gotten your inspiration? You know, nothing as beautiful and touching as that, honestly. Um, I usually come from the other side of my name's kind of silly and noise and sound it does you know so uh, when I look at characters I just try and visualize if I have to visualize it that's harder for me. If I see a picture or see the character then it's something just comes you know? and so it makes it much easier to do that. And then then you have your directors who take everything that you see automatically and it comes from your heart or your soul and they slowly tear it apart. <laughs> uh, I think they were a uh, Paul Rand character. <laughs> and, you know, if you were a tree and the wind was blowing, how would that sound? <laughs> sound a little like this. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> that's something that, that I have found that uh, is really true. When you visually see something or you get into a character, Usually the first voice that you come up with as an actor is more the truth than what a director or, you know, and obviously the director has his interpretation, but he's not you. He's hired you to do you, but he has to do him. The English there is not quite correct. He, him, her, are, I don't know. But basically, He's got a job to do, and he's got to prove that he has his interpretation, and he's got to keep the story in it. But I think that basically, when you come in as an actor, if they hire you, like, you know, uh, what's in Clint Eastwood, you know? All these actors, whenever they say to them, they say, well, what do you want me to do? Just do it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Clint, you got it. 
but there's something about your imagination and your heart in the character. And then as a performer and being hired, then you have to do what the studio does because it's their football. And then that becomes the challenge for me as an actor is bringing it back or slowing it down or you know, going where they want you to. That's enough to say it's that's our rock in the forward. Excellent. Okay, I'll give you 25 cents worth. <laughs> <laughs> well, you both had the opportunity to work and, and do your respective voices for the Transformers rides at Universal. So, I was wondering first, have you gotten the chance to go on the ride? <laughs> we rode together. Yeah, we rode <laughs> together. Oh my, that was fun. Has anybody here been on those? Yeah. Yeah. Did yeah. yeah, yeah, Adrian spit on you? <laughs> I don't know they, if they stopped that, but at the very first, they had Megatron shoot a thing of water. I don't remember exactly what it was. Remember when they hit with the water in the face and it was like Megatron was expelling or something. But it was like, you know, this was the first day or two that it was open, so that was part of it. You know, you get real surprised when you shoot water. That is fabulous. <laughs> I'm sure, uh, especially for fans of the G1, to see the movie that goes against the grain a little bit. Uh, it can be disturbing, and of course it would be for me as well. But uh, because it's a big world and uh, uh, of the movie world, and millions of dollars are more important, uh, 
from a, uh, an actor or his point of view. Uh, you, uh, you do what you're told. And uh, it's hard to justify it sometimes because inevitably I'll be answering that question for years to come. Uh, things that Optimus has said that he wouldn't normally have said in Generation One. Um, it, it's, it can be disturbing. Justified, I perhaps, I don't know if that answered your question. It sure as hell confused me. <laughs> I think I have to uh, say on that, even though you didn't ask me, I would like to see a lot more of um, the characters, you know, a little more dialogue for the characters and to see, uh, this isn't necessarily my thing, but the writers to get into the characters more, to see more of us and our history, and you know, I think there's a little bit of that, but it seems to be always into the humans, and uh, you know, I think this is Transformers, you know, Transformers world, so I'd like to see more of that. Next well, question. I also want to yes. make sure that we're leaving enough time for you to do... Okay. Sure. You to do <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you. So I've always wondered, at the end of the G1 cartoon, you're barreling off into space with Zara, and you're standing on a golden age of Cybertron, where do you guys see your characters going after that? What do you think happened? <laughs> Dr. Gray. Where we're zooming off at the end of the show. You know, I, I'm trying to think. I don't even really remember that. But, uh, now look you know. at me. I'm a black. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, uh, because we covered so much space and time, you know, you can just, I think your imagination can take it wherever you want. So I would like to vision, envision myself going back to Cybertron, trying to straighten out some things, if we get some more forces to come back and work against that. Yes, 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 yes. I've always wondered for you guys, you obviously know what an impact Transformers and the character, all the cartoons that you guys have been in, and shows, animation, games, whatever. Is there a particular show or a cartoon or something from your early days that had a big impact on you, kind of form your interests and your imagination? I love Rocky and Bowling. I couldn't, I could not wait to go from school to see that show. Remember Rocky and Bowling and Gene Gray and uh, Bill Scott? Hey, Rocky, thank you, Rock. What do you think Ben Mill from some and all that stuff? But I think that was an interesting point for me in terms of comedy and animation. It was just the best. And also, that was the first time we saw mature writing in terms of comedy that was applicable to children, adults, teenagers, whatever. It was all fun. And it was all good, clean, crazy, wonderful stuff. One more from the audience, and then we get to my Let's do one more. Yes. Don't take my microphone from me. <laughs> okay, I have a question here. When you get that Transformers <laughs> movie, the anime one, not the Michael Bay one, but anime one, and, get, and both of your characters died in the movie there. Did that look like a break for you? Why do you approach that movie? Well, I don't think it's I mean, in terms of the, the chronology, the, how do we feel? Do we feel personal? Well, Peter was crushed. I had no problem with it. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, it's a funny story. We'll tell it real quick here. We don't have much time. But we were sitting in looking at the scripts, which we didn't read, because Peter and I like to look fresh. So we're going to read the script. So we haven't read the script, Peter. Well, I'm reading, uh, and I'm getting to forget what page, maybe 17 out of 35 pages or whatever it was. And, uh, I'm looking down and it sees it and Optimus Prime uh, gasps uh, breath and dies. Right! Turn page 17. Look! Look, look, look. Look at what? <laughs> Are you kidding? No. No. I'm not here. I'm, I'm dead. 
<laughs> I'm done. Are you serious? What did I do? What did, what did, can I piss Never off? park in the director's parking <laughs> We were pretty shocked, I'll tell you. We were both very shocked. I said, what? Yeah. I felt like a, somebody on a soap opera that really annoyed the director and other actors. They said, get rid of it. <laughs> poison her. Get poison her. <laughs> well, no. Uh, how about a car accident? I'll take it. Get rid of it. You know, I said, what did I do? <laughs> but fortunately, he did come back. <laughs> You know, we, we kind of run out of time. I mean, this is something we've been doing for a while, and this is probably getting close to the last time we're going to do this script. But we thought we'd read a, a quick scene from uh, Transformers between the two of us. I don't have my glasses, so I may be speaking. Part of this could be loud. Oh, thank you. He's off. So, here we stand, leaders of the Autobots and Decepticons. We alone control the future of this planet Earth, and the universe beyond. We can share the power and the destiny of all that lies before us. I get wrong. It is not power I seek. I wish only to protect this planet, and I want no harm to come to these humans. You fool! Why throw away your life so recklessly? With Peter John from the Earth and our troops, we can rebuild Cybertron and control the galaxy. The entire universe awaits us. I will not endanger the Earth or its humans. Cybertron has shown us what devastation comes from. Greed and power. Then you will forever be my enemy, Optimus Prime. No one will stand in my way. One shall stand, one shall fall. So be it. Power through tyranny. I will never give up hope that one day we will all stand as one. Until then, Autobots, roll out. <laughs> 